Spirit. And the first is that He's holy. Do you know what it means to be holy? It just means perfect. Absolutely perfect. Perfectly clean, perfectly right, perfect in every way. He's holy. And Spirit, you can think of as just something that's invisible. So the Holy Spirit is someone you can know who's perfect, but you can't see Him. But when you believe in Jesus, He comes to live inside of you. And I know you guys have been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit, um, and Andrew has shared a little bit with me, but I'm going to be um, sharing a lot from my background and what I experienced growing up in church and, and things about the Holy Spirit that have really impacted my life, specifically being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And... Um, I don't really have a title for the message today, so that's the title. <laughs> but, um, I'm going to be just sharing really what it means to rely on the Holy Spirit. I'd love that someone prayed that over us today. Um, but also what it means to be Pentecostal. It's a word that can sometimes be scary, or there's a lot of stereotypes that come with that. But I really just want to share what the Word of God says. Um, it's nothing that I've made up. I'm just going to share the scripture today um, and pray that God would help us to understand it and experience more of God's power. So I'm just going to pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for this body here today. We just invite you to come teach us, to come help us to know you better and to make you known. Lord, I pray today that there would be wisdom and insight released and even destiny over each person's life here today as they as they follow you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I'll talk more about what that really means. But I I saw a lot of things, uh, people like laying on the floor as they prayed, and people shouting really loud, and it was just normal to me. It was kind of like everyday Sunday um, church. And I heard people speak in other languages that I had never learned or ever known, and it was always in a, a worship service like this, where one person would speak in another language, and then another person would kind of interpret that or tra translate. It's not a translation, but they would give the meaning of the message that God wanted to share to the church. So as a little kid, I just kind of figured, like, oh, someday when I'm older, I'll do that. Um, so I continued to walk with Jesus. I accepted him as Savior at a young age. But along the way, I kind of misinterpreted the gospel. I thought, Jesus saved me by grace, that I'm freely forgiven. But now it's up to me to keep it by doing the right things, by not disappointing God, by paying him back for everything that he's done for me. And it really produced this life of striving and just like trying to earn God's love and his approval, not knowing I already completely have that because of the blood of Jesus. So I, I would fast forward to my senior year in high school. And I was an athlete. I played several sports um, in high school, soccer, basketball, and track. And my senior year, playing basketball, I, in one of our most important games of the season, tore my ACL with 42 seconds left in the game. So that was kind of a bummer. But it's one of the best things that ever happened to me because um, the injury forced me to stop me. Like, even in sports, I was trying to earn God's approval and, like, use the talents he had given me to impress him somehow, which is just kind of ridiculous. But through the injury, I realized I can't play anymore. I can't please God in this way. And it really opened up my schedule to have more time. And I started to read the word for myself on a daily basis. And through that, God began to speak to me that I, I really thought I was living for him, but I was living more for myself and um, my own righteousness, relying on myself rather than him. And so that was a huge turning point for me. Instead of going to a Bible school like I wanted to, I got sent me to Purdue, and it ended up being the best thing that almost ever happened because I tore my ACL. And so that's where I got involved in Chi Alpha. And in high school, I was, in part, I was part of a small church. Uh, we didn't have a big youth group. I was one of the only kids there. And I really loved Jesus and I wanted to grow, but I felt like there was something I just wasn't experiencing and wasn't hearing about. Um, and when I got to Chi Alpha, I met all these people who were like super in love with Jesus. They talked about him all the time. They were like recklessly abandoned. They didn't care who they were talking to. Jesus would come up. And I thought, this is what I've been really hungry for. 
high school, as a Christian, I wanted to share my faith with people, and I wanted to tell other people about Jesus, but I kind of just heard in church, um, you know, the scripture, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. So I kind of understood that as if I just live the right kind of life and I'm a good person, people will notice and then they'll ask me, what's so different about you? And, you know, we've shared a lot, live a life that demands a gospel explanation, which is kind of like that verse. But living a life that demands a gospel explanation has to be coupled with the gospel explanation. And that was the part I was absolutely terrified of. And so me living this life of trying to be right and do good things and be righteous really didn't draw anybody to Jesus. It drew people to me. And that was kind of easy because we're all very selfish at our core. But if the opportunity ever did come up of like, well, why do you why do you treat your parents like that? Everyone else is like doing this. Why do you treat your parents like that, bro? I would not give an answer for like Jesus. <laughs> That would explain the gospel. I just would get tightened up and like lose my mind, my thoughts, and not know what to say. And I'd just be like, well, I just love them. <laughs> but that doesn't describe the gospel at all. But it's what I wanted to do. So as I talk today about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to talk about why that is so important. And really, it's, it's this whole idea of I really wanted to share my faith with people, but there was something that was stopping me. And when I was around these powerful of people um, who were just full of the Spirit, always talking about Jesus, I thought, I, I want whatever they have. Um, but I really needed to know why do they have what they have. And so we're going to talk today first about, you know, what it is that God's called us to do, I, which is share our faith. Um, something I really wanted to do, and just because I was a believer, but I didn't even have the right motivation for that. Even sharing my faith was something like, well, if I'm a Christian, that's what I should do. And I was really more concerned about becoming the best Christian and doing all the right things and finding God's will for my life and you know, what it, what's my purpose, what's my calling, and fulfilling that to a T. As if I um, but there were things God did just to break down those ideas. And one thing God, God spoke to me was that he doesn't need anything from me. I have nothing to give God that he hasn't already given me. And then there's a passage in Acts 17 that really describes that. But the second thing was just knowing why I really am created. You know, in America, we, we kind of idolize our calling and our, our unique gift to accomplish some purpose, but every single one of us actually have a very common, like we heard someone this summer describe it as a gloriously common calling and a gloriously common purpose. And if we know that, it doesn't matter if we have the perfect career, perfect family, perfect accomplishments, and all the success in the world, we won't be satisfied if we're not actually fulfilling our primary calling and purpose. I wanted to share a scripture, Isaiah 43, 6-7, um, and it will, will be up on the screen for you. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So we see here God talking about sons and daughters who are formed and made by God with a purpose, and the purpose is for God's glory. And when I read this, I, I kind of understood it in two ways. We're made to receive and to experience the glory of God, the weight of who he is, but we're also made to bring him glory and to be a vessel of that glory and to spread that wherever we are. It said another way in, I'm not sure if I have it here. I didn't put it in my notes, but the, um, in Habakkuk 2.14, it says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the water covers the sea. That's like God's, God's desire for the earth to be filled with the knowledge of his glory, and we're made for that glory. So we see this connection 
Um, and we're, we're part of that. So when I ask, like, why am I really here? What's my calling? What's my purpose? The best place to find it is right at the beginning. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God gave them everything that they would need to carry that out. So we see here from the very beginning... What do we learn about ourselves as, as human beings? We're created in the image of God. That means we're like Him. We can represent who He is, His glory, just by being who we are. And of course, this was before the fall. But the command He gave to the ones who bear His image was be fruitful and increase the number. Multiply my image all over the world and that's why you're here. You're created for a purpose. I formed you and made you for my glory. That you could experience it and hold it and be a container of my glory. And that that would be multiplied to the ends of the earth. So there it is. That's easy, right? Now you know your life purpose and you can do it. Well, it's not that easy, you know. And, and Jesus knew that. He said it in a similar way. I'm going to go to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. So this was the, the original command God gave to the first man and woman, is be fruitful and multiply. And Jesus says the same thing in one of his last words to the disciples. Matthew 28, we're just going to look at verses 19 and 20, where Jesus says, Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus is in a similar way saying, therefore go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in that culture, to talk about someone's name really meant to talk about their character and the essence of who they are. It really was descriptive of the whole person. So to back for us as disciples to fulfill this, to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, really means bringing people into to more unity with the person of the Father, and the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit, which is like becoming more of the image of God. So Jesus, in the same way, is saying, go and make disciples, people who will follow me and represent me and look like me in all the world, so they can experience my glory, but also spread my glory. So Jesus gave that same command, one of his last commands, kind of a big deal before he left the earth. And it's still something that we all have difficulty with. Even if we know at, at the very core of who we are, just like in high school, I knew I want to share Jesus with people. I want to tell people about Jesus. But every time it would come up, I would just shut down and freeze up because I was selfish and I was afraid. I think those are two reasons a lot of us don't share our faith. And, and they're kind of similar. To be afraid means we really care more about how I look, what people are going to think of me, what kind of risks I have to take, am I going to mess up, am I going to fail? We're afraid because we're, we care more about ourselves than about other people, so it's kind of selfish. But really what that tells me is that we don't understand who the Father is. We don't understand how much He loves us, like we sang today. I can't remember the words, this is a new song to me, but we're secure in His love. I've never been so free, I've never been so secure because I know the heart of the Lord. 
So to really know who God is affects how we overcome that fear of sharing our faith and telling people about Jesus. And it, it really reminds me of, in my own life of um, when I played sports, there's a lot of pressure. You want to win, you want to do well. And I would get so nervous and afraid just all day at school if the track meet was coming up. Because track, like everything's up to you. You're just, you're the one running or you're the one jumping and, and you don't have teammates to rely on. So I would get super nervous, especially with track. And during the day, all day, I'd be trying to focus on school, but really thinking about just like, oh, I'm so nervous, I hope I do well tonight. And the thing that calmed my nerves the most um, at the beginning was just calling my dad. And, and I would call him and just hearing his voice and hearing him say, you got this, kid. You, you're gonna do well, you're gonna do awesome. Just think about how much you've practiced and do what you have practiced and you're, you're gonna do great. And then when I would get to the competition, I would still be nervous, but every time I looked in the stands and saw my dad, I would just feel this comfort. I would feel this peace and I would feel this security that even if I don't win, even if I really fail, he's gonna come to me after and he's gonna give me a hug and he's gonna say, you did great, you did your best. Let's talk about how you can do it better next time or what do you think you could change and, and work on for next time? And it, it would become this thing of like, well, I'm not so sad I failed. I'm actually excited that now I can, I can improve and my dad's here to help me do that. So my dad was an awesome example of, of the father in heaven who wants to help us share the truth about him. He's not like, You're, you must do this. Here's the command I give you. I want you to go and share the gospel with all creation. Good luck, and uh, see you later. <laughs> Part of his promise is I will be with you to the very end of the age. And how is he with us? It's through his spirit. And so our relationship with the Holy Spirit is crucial to overcoming the fear of talking about Jesus. Um, he, he tells us in the word, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, The spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. And in Romans 8, chapter 15, I love this passage. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So the spirit is really what, what helps us identify God as our father. And if we know God is our father, why would we ever be afraid of telling someone about Jesus because they might not like us? Or they might get offended, which is kind of a big lie. Most people aren't offended if you bring up Jesus. But if we know God loves us, we can never be more loved than we are right now. We can never be more ready than we are right now. That he knows everything and he's going to share it with us the moment we need it. If we know the Father, we can overcome the fear. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is what reveals the truth about the Father to us and gives us power to overcome fear. But there's one thing that I really didn't understand growing up in a Pentecostal church and, and seeing certain gifts of the Spirit and hearing about this thing called the baptism in the Spirit, but also growing up knowing that the moment I believed in Jesus, I received the Holy Spirit, like a deposit that guarantees I'm a son or I'm a daughter, or for you, you're a son. It identifies that we have that relationship with God. It's the mark of our salvation. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit isn't the same as salvation. It's not required for salvation, but it's something that God desires for us because he knows that we have so much fear. So I want to look at one more command that Jesus gave around the same time as the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all the world. And if you'll turn with me to, we're going to look at Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, and we'll start at verse 3. It says, um, talking about Jesus, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. So this is 
Jesus, before he left earth, he was with the disciples, gave them the command to go make disciples of all nations. And around the same time, before he goes back to heaven and ascends after his resurrection, he's with them again, eating, um, and gives them another command that says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he's talking to his disciples, people who have lived with him, walked with him, talked with him, ministered with him, prayed with him. They, they know Jesus better than anybody. And he gives them many humans and proofs that he's alive. But he gives them these two commands that seem to contradict each other. Go and make disciples of all nations. But this command here is, don't leave Jerusalem. <laughs> How are you going to make disciples of every nation if you don't leave? But he says why he doesn't want them to leave. He says, wait for the gift my Father promised. Wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because in verse 8, look at verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He's saying you will fulfill the command I gave you. To make disciples in all nations. You will go to the ends of the earth, but you have to wait for this gift because it's what's going to give you power. You can't rely on your experiences with me. You can't rely on your knowledge or your wisdom or your training. You have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things, a common question about the, the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, well, is it the same as salvation? Is it the same as having the Holy Spirit or not? And it's kind of where I got hung up, because I was like, well, I know I have the Holy Spirit. Why do I need something different? He's already in me. And that's true. When you receive Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit as a deposit. And when you get baptized, you go underwater, and, and it represents your dying to your old self when you come out of the water. The water's outside of you. But I love Kevin brought up today the scripture that says, from within you, streams of living water will flow. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not like the waters outside of you. It's the waters within you being released. And it's not part of our salvation. It's separate from our salvation. But it's a release of the power that's already in us to help us be a witness and to help us overcome our fear. And it's so powerful. The word here that's used in the Greek is dunamis, which... Um, can you click one more? That's where we get the word dynamite. What is dynamite? <clears throat> Something that once it's lit up, once it's just triggered, it's going to explode and completely transform everything in its surrounding area. That's the kind of power God intended us to have to be his witnesses. And the word witness here is actually the word martus in Greek, where we would get the word martyr. He's saying, you're going to be such powerful witnesses for me. You're going to overcome your fears so much that you'd be willing to die for me. We, in this context, in our culture, may not have to die for Jesus. We may. We may not. But we do have to die to certain things, like maybe the success of the world, and not get so caught up in career or the American dream or family. But to be willing to put those things aside and say, telling people about Jesus is so much more important than that. Or our reputation. If people think I'm the crazy, foolish Christian who's always talking about Jesus, am I willing to let people think of me that way? And let my, my good reputation or my, uh, people's opinions of me die for the sake that they would hear about Jesus? So when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit and we receive the power of God, it's also the love of God casting out our fear and helping us to care more about other people than we do about ourselves because we're receiving the love of the creator of the universe. And so we see this happen as God, as Jesus told them to wait. Um, they did wait. They waited for, how many days was it? 40? 40 days? 100? 50 days. So they waited for 50 days, not really knowing what would happen. And when it did happen, this is where we get the identity of, or the word of being Pentecostal. Um, on the day of Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit came with 
many signs and wonders and empowered people to be witnesses. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys have gone over that, and I won't really look at that, that chapter today, but what happened is these people praying in the upper room together, waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall, they experienced wind, like a mighty wind with a, a mighty sound, and they experienced tongues of fire coming, like physical fire. And they also heard people speaking in other languages that they didn't know. And the result of what happened on that day um, was a complete revival, a complete outbreak of the gospel being preached. And especially with Peter, he was a man who had denied Jesus three times. And after being baptized in the Holy Spirit, he's preaching to thousands in a crowd. And they get saved because he's empowered to preach the gospel with boldness and without fear. And we see it happen. Some people believe um, that some of the signs that accompany being baptized in the Holy Spirit were just for that time, that it was a, just a special event or a special day, and that's why those things occurred. But we actually see multiple times throughout the book of Acts where this happened. And one of the same signs occurred every time, and it was the speaking in other languages. And I'm not going to share all of those today. If you want to write them down so you can look at them later, there's one in Acts 10. Acts 19, um, Acts chapter 8, and there's one more that I'm forgetting. But I'm going to look today in Acts chapter 10. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me there. And I chose this instance because it, it really touches on a lot of the common questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, and different things that you can pull out from it. So Acts 10, we're going to start with verse 36, um, and I'm going to read through quite a bit, but then I'll go back and, and pull a few things out. Verse 36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. I'm going to pause for a second to give some context. This is the story of um, Peter going to Cornelius' house, and so he had received this vision from God that the gospel isn't just for Jews, but for Gentiles also. So he's going to speak to Gentiles. And this is what he, he tells them in verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed us as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, meaning the Jews, who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Probably not a lot to read. <laughs> the one thing I love about this passage is that it answers um, a few really major questions when we talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And one of those is that... Um, do you have to be water baptized, or is it the same as water baptism, or does it happen when you're water baptized? But we see in this passage that these believers, they had heard the message of God. They had heard the gospel, and they believed in it. They knew it. And while Peter was speaking it, was when they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Peter said it happened to them the same way it happened to us on the day of Pentecost. So there were, there were signs, but the only signs they mentioned here that were like the day of Pentecost are speaking in tongues and praising God. But it also says right after that, no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. So for them, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit before they were baptized in water. 
So it's separate. And just like water baptism isn't required for salvation, it's something that comes after. That's the same thing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's something that once you are saved, it's an additional encounter, an additional release of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it really empowered them to be witnesses. So one of the, the questions of why might it be that speaking in tongues has always been accompanied with this release of power to be a witness. But if you think about what is it required when you witness about Jesus? You have to speak. You have to use your tongue. You have to use language. And so it really builds our faith. When we receive a language from God that we don't know and we're able to speak it out and we're able to pray in that language, it reminds us, I am with you. I'm giving you words. This isn't just coming from you. And when you're in front of someone and you have to tell them about Jesus and share the gospel, I'll be with you. I'll be there. I'll be coaching you. I'll be giving you your next syllable when you don't even know what you're going to say next. And if you have shared the gospel with someone, it's so much like that, that when you're done, you're like, well, I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> I'm not sure. It was really awesome, but I can't really recreate it because it didn't come from me. It came from the Holy Spirit within me being poured out through my tongue, through my words. And so it's really the gift of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, also receiving the gift of being able to, to pray in another language is an incredible way for us to build our faith and overcome fear because it's a constant reminder of how intimately involved the Father is in, in our pursuit to tell other people about him. He hasn't left us, surely. He's with us always at the end of the age. And as we, as we respond to that today, Andrew's going to come up and um, just lead us in. If that's something you want to experience, I, I first want to share just a little bit more of how I experienced this and how it impacted my life. Um, like I said, I was in Chi Alpha around people, and I pretty quickly figured out all of these people have experienced this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's really given them this boldness to not care what other people think. And um, I was reading more about it, learning more about it on my own, and then I went to our conference, our fall conference, and the, the pastor was speaking about something completely different. I think he was talking about end times and Jesus coming back. And we just had a normal altar time where people could come up and pray for different needs. And in the middle of it, he came up and said, um, not the phone, in my room. God, God told me that there's someone here today that wants you back to the Holy Spirit. And if that's you, just come around and pray for you. And it'll happen. Well, what I haven't shared yet is that I did hear about this when I was 12 or 13 at a youth conference, and I went up to pray for someone, or pray with someone, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I just, I didn't know what to expect, I didn't really know why I was praying this, I just, they, I just wanted more of God, and I thought, you know, this will be good, so I went, and I knew somehow I would, be, I would speak another language, so I went and prayed, and I opened my mouth, and I thought, like, God will come and, like, take control of my tongue, and I'll start speaking, and I just waited, and nothing happened. <laughs> So I, I kind of figured, like, well, maybe this isn't for everybody. Maybe it's just for older, more mature Christians who have everything put together. And that's not it at all. <laughs> Being baptized in the Holy Spirit really is a, a sign of humility and weakness. That, man, I cannot do this life on my own. I can't fulfill God's purpose for my life on my own. I am so weak that I need His power to fill me. And so when I was at this conference where the pastor totally called me out. God had my number. I was frozen in fear. I was sitting just in one of the pews and I looked at my feet and I couldn't move. I wanted to. This was something I wanted to experience, but I was so afraid of like, what if it doesn't work? What if it's not for me? What if it doesn't happen? And I, I literally like tried to move and couldn't because the enemy was lying to me. And he knows that it's something that's really going to empower us to, to impact the world and to impact, make an impact for the kingdom of God. So I just sat down where I was and cried and I thought I ruined everything. But God was so gracious. The next service, when I came back to campus, our pastor talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God had helped me overcome that fear. I was also afraid of like, well, 
people probably think I already am because I'm like already loving Jesus and I, I'm kind of embarrassed when people like think I'm less of a Christian because I haven't done this already. So I, I had that, all these fears, which is really important that God broke those because it completely changed my life that night when I did get back to the Holy Spirit. The next day when I was walking to class, just like normal, instead of thinking about my next assignment or what I had to study, I was noticing all these people walking down the street beside me who would not spend eternity with Jesus. And my heart just was heavy in a different way and broken in a different way and cared more in a different way that I, I would notice things I didn't notice before. And I would hear God prompt me to talk to people in ways that I didn't before. And instead of just wanting people to bring up Jesus, I often would feel something inside me just bubbling up like, okay, you need to bring it up now. And, and it was the power of God that had been released to help me be a bolder witness. And I still am afraid. <laughs> it's not going to get rid of all fear. That's something we have to cooperate. But it, it, allowed, it opened the door and allowed me to hear the things that I didn't even hear before. And to hear the Holy Spirit prompt me and move me in ways. And then it was my job to respond and trust that, God, your spirit is with me and you've empowered me. And so, as Andrew comes, um, I just want to invite anyone who's really interested, not in speaking tongues, speaking in tongues, and maybe you do have a prayer language, but that's all it's been, and it hasn't been about really being a witness, because that's the purpose. We need boldness, and being able to speak in this, this prayer language that, that God gives us as a gift is just an added bonus that it really helps us to pray, especially for lost people in our life. Um, it's never too late to receive this gift. It's for everybody. Um, yesterday as I was waking up, that was something really strong in my heart that it, for, for this body that it's not too late. If it's something you haven't experienced and you're like, well, what's the point now? I've like lived most of my life and um, I probably can't be this awesome radical witness. You do. You have people in your life that need Jesus, and and it's just more of God. When I came to college, I didn't even realize there were there was something I, I didn't have, but God still wanted me to have it, and it's a gift that He really wants you to have, so that you can spread His glory, experience His glory, and experience other people seeing the glory of God through you as a witness.
They had, they had the one requirement. They had already put their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So this morning, I don't um, know personally everybody in the room. Before we ask and respond and say, hey, I want to I want to receive this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit, maybe you want to receive the gift of salvation. I guess salvation comes when we say, Jesus, I want to make you Lord of my life. I'm deciding today that I'm not going to be the Lord of my own life. I'm not going to live on my own. I'm not going to live my own ways. But I'm surrendering my life to you, Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. And I want to live completely for you. So why don't we all just close our eyes and just for a moment of privacy, but even a moment to be able to concentrate on God. And I want to ask this morning, maybe you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never made the step of saying, Jesus, I want you to be Lord. I want to receive the salvation. I want to receive forgiveness from you, Jesus. And if that's you this morning, I'll just invite you to, to raise your hand and to that. You're saying, you're, it's a sign to God. You're saying, God, I want to live for you. I want to receive your forgiveness. I've decided today to make you Lord of my life. If that's, that's you for the first time, or maybe you're, re, you're recommitting, you're saying, I want to make you Lord of my life. So I want to pray a prayer. This prayer isn't like magical, it isn't like there's nothing special about it, but the but the words is a you're telling to God, you're surrendering to you're making the decision. Yeah. So you can you can repeat after me as I as I pray this prayer. And you're gonna pray from your heart to the Father and just say, Father, forgive me. Let's pray together. Repeat after me. Father, I thank you for sending your son in my place. Thank you for sending your son in my place. Today I receive forgiveness for my sins. Today I forgive you for my sins. That was made possible by Jesus. That was made possible by Jesus. Today not only do I receive forgiveness. Today I only receive forgiveness. But I'm making a decision of my will. I'm making a decision of my will. Place you, Jesus, as Lord of my life. Place you, Jesus, as Lord of my life. Help me to live for you, Jesus. Help me to live for you, Jesus. All the days of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer today, you meant it in your heart. I believe that this is a beginning of a journey of you living a life for Jesus. It's a really important step for us to put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. Now we can have a right relationship with the Father. And this morning's message was really important. Because it's talking about a subject that, that Jesus wanted for us. He told his believers to wait for this. He told them, he, I, I have this for you. I want this for you. Wait for this. You'll receive it. And when you receive it, you're going to receive a power that's going to change your life. This morning, as um, Kevin and Mom lead us into another uh, one song, here this morning, you say, Andrew, Ruth, Pastor, I want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to be baptized by the Holy Spirit so that I might receive power to be a witness. I would invite you to come forward. And on the different occasions in the book of Acts, the elders of the church, the leaders, would lay their hands on people and they would pray that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when they prayed, the Spirit of God came upon those they prayed for. So if that's you this morning, I would invite you to come. We're going to take a few, a few more minutes. And if you would say, hey, I want to receive the baptism of the Spirit, come up forward and Brooke and I and, and Pastor will, will lay hands and we'll believe that God's going to fill you with this Spirit that empower you to be a witness to radically change your life from this day forward.
Your prayer.